Our first reading is from the ninth chapter of the Gospel of Mark, verses 33 to 37. Then they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent, for on the way they had argued with one another who was the greatest. He sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Then he took a little child and put it among them, and taking it in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. Amen. Our second reading is from chapter 8 of Paul's letter to the Romans, verses 12 through 17. So then, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation. But it isn't an obligation to ourselves to live our lives on the basis of selfishness. If you live on the basis of selfishness, you're going to die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the actions of the body, you will live. All who are led by God's Spirit are God's sons and daughters. You didn't receive a spirit of slavery to lead you back again into fear, but you received a spirit that shows you are adopted as his children. With this spirit, we cry, Abba, Father. The same spirit agrees with our spirit that we are God's children. But if we are children, we are also heirs. We are God's heirs and fellow heirs with Christ if we really suffer with him so that we can also be glorified with him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks. Thanks be to God. For the last few weeks, uh, we have been hearing each other's stories. After having spent the summer uh, listening to God's story, uh, now we're hearing God's story spoken uh, through our story in the life of this church. Uh, and today, we're going to hear that story uh, from Davis King. Davis King. I have been participating in the life of First Church since 2006, joined in 2009. It's my roots start before I was born. I mean, I was born into a family that the church was not an option. It's hard not to, to discuss the first challenge to my faith, which was the sickness and illness and, and death of my mother when, when I was young. Um, because that, that definitely plays a part in my faith story. I was uh, 11 when she got sick and 18 when she passed away. And I would have to say that the church did its job. And I wonder uh, if it hadn't at that crucial time in my life, uh, if I would still be willing to be part of church today. They were there. The church was there when it needed to be. That experience then is such a part of where I am now and why I am where I am now. And as difficult as that was, I don't know that I'd change it. I can reflect on the season and find great beauty and even a little bit of joy. And one of the best examples I can give is, is when I've had the opportunity to be there for somebody else going through the same thing. I realize in those moments that I couldn't be there being for somebody else, uh, what somebody was for me years before, had I not had that loss. And not that it makes the loss any less of a loss, it makes it into something different. It <laughs> resurrects it into something new. It takes death and turns it into hope. Um, I always knew that when I needed to figure something out, that I could find the answers at a church someplace. Um, and so uh, being in Austin, I got to a point where I knew I needed to go to a place where I could figure some stuff out. Um, and uh, that happened to be here. Uh, as you mentioned, I, I took a class at seminary. I 
looked into going to seminary further. And in, in the process of that, um, my friends started having kids. Uh, my sister had kids. And I had people telling me that I was really good with kids. Um, comments that I, I, I felt strange even in hearing or receiving. Like, I remember helping my sister work out something with one of her kids, and she said, wow, I don't think I would have come up with that way of dealing with that. Um, here's a weird one. Having friends offer, tell me that I needed to be a father and offer to carry a child for me. I thought that was a pretty good endorsement. <laughs> and I think that told me something, and that's about the time that I, I felt like I needed to explore that a little bit. And, and I, I explored that. I told, I, Laura Green and I had a conversation. And so at, at first I explored um, the idea of you know finding a surrogate and actually having a child. Because that seemed appealing for some reason. Um, but in the meantime, my, the conversation that I had with Laura was that you know I should spend some time with working with the kids. Um, and I think the, really the first thing I did was to uh, volunteer for VBS. That experience reinforced for me the, those comments that people had made. I could now see what other people saw. Wow. <laughs> I think that's, that's the key. I could, I could now see what other people had told me that I didn't quite believe yet, right? I, my first volunteering summer at VBS, there was a con confirmation that I'm good with kids. Kids like me, respond to me. So I don't know where that's coming from. I, I really, if I had to tell you why, I don't know why. I didn't practice at it. It just kind of, I showed up for that first VBS and it all came out, right? The unexpected talent, right? The surprise is what it felt like. Those comments led to further exploration of that by um, taking an open position at the preschool uh, here at Fump. Shout out for Fump. Mm -hmm. uh, where at every turn I kept finding more and more reinforcement. The idea of going to seminary, that was coming from somewhere in here. There was an element of control of that that was me. The, the, the child care and the um, idea of becoming a parent, would it sound too weird to say I don't feel like I'm in control of it? <laughs> it certainly won't be when there are children living with me. Right? I have so much in the way of supporting loving people, financial stability, uh, a home, a family that cares for me. Uh, I have so much of this, and I have the ability to pursue things that are not about um, putting food on my table. I can do something with my time that's about something other than me and my life, and what to do about that, and how to use that time. Um, and where that comes from is all of the exploration of my faith. Um, one of my favorite stories that we've discussed recently is the rich young ruler, you know, because he who went away sad because he had much stuff. I kind of felt like that guy. You know, I felt asked to sell all and didn't know how to, what that really meant for me, you know. Um, did that mean literally selling everything, or did that mean rededicating those things to something other than myself? And finding ways to do that. And couple that with the idea of children, that that would be a possible way to open up my home and my resources um, to something outside of myself. So a real watershed moment um, for that was about year ago last October, this past October, I went to a Travis County um, information session about foster parenting. The data that they presented left me 
convinced that I could do something and that that left me no more excuses, right? That, you know, I couldn't complain that I stuttered or that I, <laughs> or that I was too old or anything like that. I, I, I had been faced with the uh, sad truth that children need homes in, in our state, in, this, in the world, and don't have them. And coupled with the fact that I could provide that and I couldn't pull the two apart anymore. It doesn't mean that I didn't try to think of a lot of reasons not to. I had that thought of I'm single. There's nobody to go tag your it to when things are getting a little too heated. But uh, every time I thought about those obstacles, I thought about the people around me that could support me here in this community and, and uh, others. So uh, I went through weeks of training, six hours, of every Saturday and after that and a number of people coming to my house and making sure everything was cool that it wasn't a fire hazard or that I actually had running water and um, and after hours of interviews with me uh, I am licensed by the state to be a foster parent and have uh, been working with a few kids at Helping Hand Home Treatment Center I have asked to have one of those kids come and live in my home. How do I feel about that? When people ask me about it, um, I'm excited about it. When I'm thinking about it at home at night by myself, it's a little nerve wracking. Yeah. <laughs> Have I noticed God in all of that? Um, I notice God in, in the part that I'm not in control of. There's just, a certain part of this that doesn't have my need to manage it on it. A certain part of this experience that is coming from somewhere I can't quite tell you where, or from some influence that I can't quite put a word to. Um, and I think that's what we call God or maybe the Holy Spirit. Thank you for sharing your story, Davis. Uh, I have learned some things to be true that I studied in classes and read in some psychology texts and seen among several of the members of the congregations that I've served. It's that children who are adopted and children in foster care often struggle with self-esteem and identity development issues at a greater rate than those that aren't adopted or foster kids. The result is that they struggle to know who they are and that they are loved. Who am I? Am I loved? These are fundamental questions for all of us. That's why it's a parent's primary responsibility to instill a sense of unconditional love in their child. The unshakable knowledge that they are loved and that nothing can change that. That's what builds a child's core confidence and roots their identity for a lifetime. Davis had this in his parents. And when his mother died, uh, it was reinforced by the love of the church community as well. In the video, Davis spoke about how it feels to know he may have a little one come to live with him in his home. He said... In the daylight, it feels pretty good. It's at night. <laughs> it's at night when I worry that it might be too much. It's at night when the fear creeps in. In the night, when we feel that we are alone, our fears challenge us. But the community is the light 
of day that reassures us of God's love and encourages our faithfulness in the midst of and despite of our fears. The community reminds us who we are, whose we are. The community reminds us of our identity in Christ. The community, the ones who so often recognize God's work in our lives before we do, you heard it in Davis recounting uh, how others recognized that he was good with children. The external witness of the Spirit to us through the community helps us to unforget our identity and to hear our calling to new life, our calling to give our life despite our fear. The community loves us, reminding us of our identity, reassuring us that we can connect, that we can attach to each other for support and love. You see, the gift of God's love isn't something that we possess. It's, it's not as if it had a limit or could be contained or could be controlled. No, God's love overflows. It rises like the tide and it carries us along. In fact, it's God's love that possesses us. We're reminded of God's love possessing us, enfolding us, giving us identity and unconditional love when we remember our baptism. God's love overflowing for us. Of course, God's love overflows for all of us, and yet... Too often, by the world's abandonment and by human frailty, that loving parent may not have been there, may not have been fully present in our lives to convey God's love through human hands as God intends. That's where the community needs to step in. Step in and foster and be adoptive parents, and especially the church. Those who have been incorporated into Christ's story of rising, of giving one's life away as an overflowing act of sharing God's love. Davis spoke of that moment when he went to the foster parent info session. And the data left him convinced that someone had to do something. And then came the switch, the overflowing of love. When he said, I could do something. I could do something. That's the God-given identity, overflowing with the love that God has given for all of us. There are endlessly grand many causes, wrongs to be righted, illnesses to be healed, righteous movements for social change, and yes, frustrations as endless as our news feeds. It can overwhelm us. Nevertheless, where do we have the power to, cha to affect change, to make a difference, to do something? I challenge you, whether it's a difference small or not so small, before any of us can run off and throw ourselves against the world to make a lasting difference. We, know, we need to know who we are. We need to be reminded of our identity. To be rooted in unconditional love that God has for us. To have a community that continually reassures us of that love. We need to give up ourselves and let God's love overflow in our lives and possess us. You see, God's love is not a, whip, a weapon to beat back the darkness. It's a light to illumine the world and to welcome those who are hurting because they have missed out on receiving that unconditional love that comes from God. That desire to fight, to get angry, to divide up into our tribes of race or political affiliation or culture. All of that is our own ego, trying to beat the world into being in our own likeness. 
We need to give up ourselves and let God's love overflow in our lives and possess us. Richard Rohr says that great love and great suffering are the normal paths of transformation. It's only by experiencing the great heights of God's love for us or by experiencing the great depths of suffering where there seems to be an absence of God's love that we can ever get outside ourselves, our false selves, and be truly transformed. Those in recovery from addiction know this to be true. It was when they were at their darkest that they could surrender themselves to something greater. And simply, similarly, it's when we're in the throes of love, when we experience a transcendence beyond ourselves, a desire to live our lives in service of someone else. Great love and great suffering. Those are the times when the illusion of our control is pierced. Those are the times when we recognize God in the part in which we are not in control of. That's when we realize that we have been adopted, adopted by love, and that we can be faithful despite our fears, to step out and make a difference, to open our lives, our homes, to those in need of God's love expressed through our lives. You have been adopted by God's unconditional love. You can be faithful despite fear. Your identity is in Christ. And the transformation being done in you with the supportive light of the community, it's the method by which God is transforming the world around us and reminding us do not be afraid, I am with you. I have called you each by name. Come and follow me, I will bring you home. I love you and you are mine.